need to get started here this morning. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8. Now we're looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. You say, what in the world does Acts chapter 8 have to do with the parable of the Good Samaritan? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, chapter 8 is the first time that a Gentile is saved in the, in the New Testament way that we know of getting saved. Everything up until that point is kind of a transitional period. Uh, between the uh, New Testament during Jesus' time and <coughs> what we know now is the church age. Um, in Acts chapter 8, uh, verses 24, um, there's, a, there's a character that uh, appears um, here. His, his name is Simon, and he's a, he's a sorcerer, uh, which means he... Uh, you know, he, he dabbles in uh, conjuring and uh, fortune telling and soothsaying and, uh, you know, crystal balls and that sort of thing. And he gets saved. And he sees all these things that the apostles are doing to the Jews uh, because they have the signs that God gave to the Jews. Uh, and he wants, he wants that power. And he's kind of an ignorant fella. Um, but uh, he offers... To buy as if you could buy stuff from the Lord like that. Look, you can't buy God. You can't buy the truth. You can't buy uh, the power of God. Uh, you can't buy a congregation, although some pastors do try. Uh, you say, how do they do that? Well, uh, there's, there's stories about uh, that guy, Hiles Anderson, up there in uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, he would pass out hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff on the bus to all these kids he'd pick up. And, uh, you know, uh, the trouble is, is when he died, um, the church went to nothing. And uh, the only thing left up there is a couple little churches just about our size and the college and the church, the, the big church that once was just a, just a big empty building. Um, same thing in Texas. Um, <coughs> Dr. George Truth, which was uh, a Southern Baptist pastor during the time that uh, J. Frank Norris was pastor there in Fort Worth. Um, he applied some of the same methods that uh, uh, Norris did, and he, he had about 10,000 people at one time. And uh, the church is still going. And they had a fire two weeks ago, burnt, burnt the old sanctuary down. And uh, so, you know, and it didn't hurt them because it was empty. They didn't use it anymore. Um, I'll tell you the truth, people. I'd rather have you guys that are serious about the Bible and the Lord and love the Lord and follow the Lord than five times this congregation size that can fit in here. Uh, <coughs> we need dedicated people. Uh, but this Simon guy in Acts chapter 4, verse 24, um, it says, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Um, uh, he, was, uh, he was told to repent of his wicked covetousness that he had. Uh, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, talking about, uh, let's see who it is, Peter preaching here, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel as in many villages of the Samaritans. Um, and then, of course, the Lord gets a hold of Philip and sends him down to the Ethiopian unit. But I want you to notice what I'm trying to get a hold of here is that the early stages of the gospel went right through Samaria and they preached to those people. Uh, and, of course, it, it, they heard about Jesus through the woman on the well and the little city of Sychar there. <coughs> A lot of people in that city believed on Jesus when he was alive. So they kind of expand on that, and they start preaching to these people. Um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about this man that they found. Um, and the Samaritan had uh, feelings of compassion. And uh, it's funny that we bring this up, but part of the human condition is our weaknesses. Amen to that? Which is weaknesses. And uh, as you get older, you find more weaknesses. Um, and I, I wish it was otherwise, but it's not. 
uh, if the Lord tarries and you live long enough, you will see something, or sometimes several things, in your being just kind of go south. And you say, what do you do? Well, sometimes you can have surgery. Uh, sometimes you can, uh, you know, go through therapy. Sometimes they can give you some meds that will help you. Um, but uh, in the end, it, every, everybody has this kind of condition. And it's something, uh, I, I, I can't say y'all look forward to it, because you're probably not going to. Uh, but you need to prepare for it, because everybody goes through it. Very rarely do I run across anybody that's in their 70s or 80s that, uh, you know, runs, runs track every day and, you know, uh, it's what they call spry. I've met a few people like that. Uh, I'll tell you one that was like that was uh, Mrs. Smith. Uh, that lady was a go-getter until about the day she died. i tell you what. Um, I think you had a hard time keeping up with her, didn't you? Oh, well, yeah, I think you did. Uh, but, but she, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She, she'd bring me all kinds of stuff out of the garden. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I'd, go, I'd go over to Lowe's. And uh, I don't know whether she haunted the parking lot waiting for me to talk to me. But I'd come out with my bag and buggy and stuff, and there she'd pull on to hammer the gym. <laughs> and it was always a blessing to see her. Uh, but eventually, you know, we get weak. And uh, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 7, 17. Uh, last, last week we looked at numbers. Um, but the Bible does address these issues. The Apostle Paul had eye trouble, apparently. Um, I tell you, one tough cookie in the Bible was John the Apostle. Um, not many men could survive very long on a little island like Patmos. I don't know if you've looked at pictures of Patmos, but it ain't much. I'd hate to be, you know, kind of stuck there. Uh, Ezekiel 7, 17. Uh, now, it, it, uh, it, it's talking uh, about Israel, and it, it's speaking uh, of Israel as if they were uh, one person, which God does several times. Uh, he says, all hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be, look, weak as water. Um, it, it's a good thing to stand up and walk around. But boy, I tell you what, when, when your legs go out from under you, that's a bad thing. Um, and uh, a, a lot of elderly people and a lot of uh, even middle-aged people now are having trouble uh, with... Um, their legs, their hips, their knees, their ankles, their feet. Uh, and they've capitalized on it. Um, how many commercials do you see for um, sneakers and things? Uh, even on the internet, you go to YouTube and there's all kinds of little commercials pop up about this shoe and this magic shoe and it'll make you feel great. And, you know, I. I appreciate a good shoe, but a shoe don't care what ails you. <laughs> it may help you along, okay? Uh, but that's about all it does because part of the human condition is weakness. Um, I Miss Marcia is pretty weak right now. She's got this bug. And, uh, you know, uh, thank God she's got Brother Vic to take care of her. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen that. Um, I'm trying to remember that fellow's name. Um, he, he lived around the corner from me over there on, on Jackson Street. Uh, but he used to come and his wife, and uh, he, uh, I remember the last time I visited him, it was a couple of days before he died, and uh, he, he thanked me for being his pastor, and uh, he thanked <coughs> me for helping him get right with the Lord, and uh, it was very sweet. Um, and I remember before I left, I looked down at him and said, Brother, 
I don't know when I'm going to be back here uh, in the next couple days. And I, and I said, uh, I'll probably have to see you in heaven. He said, you will. And I'll be glad when you get there. And I'll, 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 I'll be greeting you when you step through the gate. And I have no doubt of that. Um, that's, a, that's the wonderful thing about being a Christian. We never lose anybody. They just change addresses, folks. And one day we'll see all of our loved ones that were Christians. Um, so this fella laying by the side of the road, he needed someone to have feelings for him and to help him. And uh, so this Samaritan, uh, the, the Jews that were passing by could care less about this poor guy. He was going the wrong way, but you know what? This Samaritan uh, saw somebody that was worth saving. And I'm glad that God saw me, that I was worth saving. And he saw you, and you were worth saving. And you say, well, what about some of these really, really bad people? God sees everybody is worth saving. He sent his son to die on the cross for them. Um, he knew this guy, he knew what he needed, okay? Um, that's another thing I want to say about this compassionate stranger. Uh... The Levi didn't go close enough to see the guy's real condition. The priest went over there and looked, but I guess he didn't care. But this guy, he cared, and um, we don't know what this fella did for a living. Uh, evidently, he traveled up and down. Uh, maybe he was a trader, or maybe he was, uh, you know, um, some kind of uh, merchant. Maybe he uh, captained the ship. I, you know, I don't know what he was doing. Um, there's all kinds of things people did in the Bible days just like now. But he was able to go over there and tell that this fella, he needed more than just something he could do on the side of the road. Um, you can talk to these. If you ever get a chance to talk to these fellas that run the EMS, uh, either one that's riding around in the car or the ones that are running the ambulances, uh, when I, when I go to the hospital, sometimes I, I run across them. And one day, one of them was taking a break. And uh, I knocked on the door and said, uh, I'm Pastor So-and-so. And, -so, and uh, you mind if I come in and, and talk to you a while? Uh, I, I said, what you do is a great thing. And uh, sometimes I preach about stuff where, uh, you know, I, I bring uh, things like what you do up. And uh, I said... Uh, I said, what, what's the first thing you do when you come across someone that's been in an accident or when you go to someone's house? He says, we have to determine what their state is, what their wounds are, what their mental state is, and you, we can't, by law, we can't do anything to this person until we figure out what's wrong with them. And then if there's someone else in the house with them, we have to kind of ask them some questions because sometimes they can help us determine what's wrong with this person. And I remember when they came and got my wife and took her to the hospital, uh, they did exactly that. Uh, they took her blood pressure, they, you know, they got the whole thing out, looked in her eyes and ears and, uh, you know, took her pulse and, um, and then, uh, then they determined that she needed to be transported by gurney. And so they brought the gurney in and they carefully got her, got her up in the gurney and put her in the, uh, thing and took her on. But they didn't do anything until they figured out because a lot of times when you call 911 you're excited and you're panicked and Amen. something's wrong and you don't know what in the world's going on because you're not a doctor either. Yeah. And so, but this guy knew enough that he could tell that this poor guy lying on the side of the road uh, he needed more than just a band-aid and uh, uh, some Bactine and you know a couple aspirin. Uh, and I imagine he was very careful putting him on the donkey and uh, maybe he uh, strapped him in somehow and then he took him off somewhere where he could get some some real help from somebody and he paid when he got there he paid for them uh, and we'll, we'll uh, go over that but um, wounded people do have a bad chance of dying and think back in Bible days they didn't have any antibiotics they didn't have any uh, you know uh, Band-aids in a box. Uh, you were lucky if you got a clean piece of cloth to wrap around a wound in those days. And then you had to tie it off. Uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 30. And uh, 
Ezekiel's a funny book. It talks about a lot of strange things. And it talks about this very subject, actually. And you say, well, what did Ezekiel know about it? Quite a bit. Remember, Ezekiel lived through the time when the Babylonians and the Assyrian Empire had conquered the land of Israel. And they had broke down the walls of Jerusalem and they had killed many of the Jews in the city. And the Jews had hid themselves uh, in places and uh, a lot of times they would try to fight back. Well, uh, if you were taken captive, that was fine. They'd take you and march you over to Babylon. Um, but if you fought back, they, they felt like you were a combatant and they would kill you. So I imagine Ezekiel in his young days saw a lot of people that were wounded and that died from their wounds. So, so he did know some things about this. Um, look at verse 24. It says, And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and will put my sword in his hand and I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. Now I want you to notice that last phrase, a deadly <coughs> wounded man. Sometimes you could wound someone and they would recover. Uh, in, in the Civil War days, um, if you just got a nick um, and they took you to the field hospital, chances are you'd live. Uh, maybe if you got shot through with a bullet and it went and it went, came in and exited, depending on where it went, um, and of course, back in those days, if, if, you, if they couldn't save the land, they amputated it. And uh, but a lot of people lived through that, and they lived. But then again, there were a lot of people that no no matter how much doctrine was done to them, they they just didn't make it. Uh, that started to change in the middle part of the 20th century. Um, they, they discovered in the 30s and 40s that you could uh, uh, put blood into people and, and do a transfusion. And if you took the same, uh, and they discovered blood typing and all that stuff, and they discovered that if you put new blood from another person that was healthy into a wounded person, that person's antibodies and uh, things would go into that person and help repair that person's body. And there was a uh, like a jump of like 40% of people that survived the wounds in World War I and the Korean War just because of transfusions and things. Now see, we don't think anything of that because you just go to the hospital and there's all kinds of little baggies hanging by the bed and you know, tubes and things going into people. And they've discovered that uh, all kinds of things to help somebody that's wounded or have something wrong with them uh, to keep them going till they either heal up or they can have surgery or something else. And they're very good at it. Uh, but even so, there were people that uh, died terribly in, in wartime uh, because sometimes these battles raged for days and days and days and they couldn't get to the person in time. And they would lie out there on the battlefield and they'd die. Um, and it's a terrible thing. So this man determined that this guy hadn't died yet, and if he laid there long enough, he would die, but if he helped him right away and got him to somebody that would care for him, they didn't have hospitals back in those days, uh, but they, he found an inn, and he uh, you know, got him a room, and he <coughs> paid, paid the innkeeper to help him. Now, the average, the average granny and... and person back in those days, they knew all kinds of things. And don't think they were totally stupid. Um, they had already found that uh, this stuff that bubbled up from the ground, this black stuff, we call it crude oil. That if they took that crude oil and they, they cooked it down and they cooked all the black stuff out of it, what they ended up with was the thing that we call Vaseline. And they found that if they smeared that on a wound, it would help heal it up. They also knew that honey, 
from the honeybee. Had antibiotic properties, and they would use that like antibiotic cream. And they would wrap the bandage. And of course, they they had they knew that they needed to change the bandage uh, frequently on people. Um, because <coughs> if they left it on too long, it, it would turn green and they'd have to cut something off. Um, so this man knew that the, some kind of uh, medical treatment was uh, uh, needed. Now, if you look at Jeremiah 30, and we're going to look at some of this uh, medical treatment, and it's surprising how far some of this stuff goes back. People always uh, talk, bring about the, the, uh, the Greeks, but I tell you what, the Hebrews knew quite a bit too. <coughs> so did the Babylonians and the Persians. Uh, their trouble is they were they were idolaters, and um, sometimes they would try to uh, uh, attach some kind of supernatural uh, goings on to some of these medicines. Uh, the Indians would do that. They would uh, they had medicines that would work on people, but you know they they felt that if you gave them the medicine but you didn't do the medicine dance that it wouldn't work. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, don't bother doing the medicine dance over me. Just give them the meds and they'll be okay. You know, I'm, you know, wouldn't that be funny if you went to the drugstore and and they they brought that little baggie out, you know, with a little ball of pills and said, hold on, we got to do the med we got to do the pill dance, you know. I think that would be hilarious. But of course, do things like that. Uh, I know I got a weird sense of humor. All right, uh, German thirty, uh, verse thirteen. Um, there is none to plead their cause that thou mayest be bound up thou hast no healing medicines you see there in bible days they knew some things healed folks um, there is an old timey thing that they used to do uh, in Scandinavia uh, you know, it's cold in Scandinavia, and uh, they have very long winters. Uh, but what they would do is they would find them an elm tree, okay? And they would go to the elm tree, and they would take their axe, and they would cut a notch in it, like the syrup people do. And then they would hang a, a pan or a bucket or some kind of leather bag or something and they would collect the sap would start to come out and, and that kind of tree didn't pour out like maple syrup it kind of came out in a ball and eventually it would just fall into the bag and then they would send somebody to get that ball of stuff and they would stick it in a, a pot over the fire and they would kind of blow <coughs> all the imperfections out of it and they would make this resin kind of thing and they would let it cool or it wouldn't burn nobody <coughs> And then they would rub that into the wounds of people that had been wounded. And they found that, uh, and they studied that tree, and, that, and they found that, that that resin is full of what we know now as penicillin. And they didn't know what they were doing, but they knew that when they did that, things healed <coughs> better quicker. So don't think that people back in those days were totally stupid. They knew medicines that work and medicines that don't. Um, our trouble is in America, we, we were kind of, uh, uh, during the early uh, 18, uh, late 1800s and early 20th <coughs> century, there were people that went around and uh, they, they came in a wagon and they gave what they call a medicine show. And uh, somebody would get up and maybe do a little tap dancing or something. Or, uh, then, then if one of them played the banjo, they'd get out and sing a song. Uh, usually it was some kind of Christian song. And then, then the old grandpa would get up and he would have a bottle of, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so's magical elixir, you know. And it would cure everything from cancer to athlete's foot, you know, I mean. Uh, and medicine got a bad name because of those things. Because a lot of them a lot of them not only didn't do anything, but a lot of them were kind of poisonous. You drank enough of it, it'd kill you. Uh, so people, you know, uh, they started making fun of these guys. And, uh, you know, um, in the 20s, if you mentioned patent medicine, you kind of get, uh, 
you know, people would snicker because you know, their grandma died or their uncle died or, you know, because they swore by, you know, Dr. So-and-so's magical water and it didn't do anything. Uh, I used to collect bottles. And believe me, there are thousands and thousands of thousands of those empty bottles of stuff. And if you really, now, if you really want to get a bottle that's worth a lot, find you a bottle of that stuff that's still got a cork in it and it's still full and still in its box. I had one of those one time. That thing was worth $2,000. <coughs> and someone stole it. I don't know who, but they stole it. Uh, that was the most valuable bottle I had. Uh, so you see, uh, uh, there are medicines that help you and then there are other medicines. Now, things that people complain about now. Uh, doctors give a lot of medicines out now. And what some people have the theory is these medicines kind of, some of them go together and some of them kind of fight against each other. I don't know about that. I'm not a doctor. Uh, look, if you don't trust your doctor or, or, you know, something like that, go find you another doctor. There are plenty of them around. You've got the Baptist group of doctors. You've got the Sacred Heart group of doctors. You've got the Medical Center in the West Florida Hospital group of doctors. And then you've got a bunch of just independent people that kind of float around and they're all free, you know, and, and you can find a doctor for whatever ails you, you can find a doctor. Uh, if you like me, you end up with two, three, four, five doctors that you go to. Uh, they know how to suck money out of the insurance company. Yeah, anyway. All right. Uh, we're uh, we're going to come back next week. Um, I'm going to show you this is one of the reasons uh, that Jesus uh, had a big following. Because he could heal people without medicine. And that's a, that's a miracle of God. And you say, does God heal people without medicine today? I've seen God do it. What I have not seen is anybody with the power of healing. I don't believe in that because I believe that's a sign and that's for the Jews and the Jews quit being part of the church a long time ago. They rejected Christ as their Savior and God scattered them. And every now and then a few Jews get saved and there's people who go out and try to win Jews and I believe they can get saved. But the signs and wonders of Israel no longer operate in this age. They will one day when the tribulation comes back but right now, I don't believe in them, and I don't believe you should either. And don't let anybody try to fool you and believe it. it's, it's what, what's going on, because it's just not. I wish it was. Wouldn't it be nice to go to a technique somewhere and go in there with, uh, you know, some kind of rare cancer instead of having to go through all that expensive chemotherapy and radiation and stuff? Wouldn't it be nice just to walk out all, you know, hail and hell? It'd be nice, but don't, don't, don't buy into that. Uh, you're better to get on your knees because when I go to the doctor I pray that God will give do the doctor wisdom how to treat him. because he's just a human too and uh, I've had I've had a couple problems to, through my time not many thank the Lord alright Heavenly Father thank the Lord for this good story I've spent weeks and weeks and weeks on this one story God but this is one of the most famous stories in the Bible and it has so much to teach us, Lord, about uh, healing our spiritual uh, beings, Lord. Because uh, sometimes the devil comes and he, he has a field day, God. He beats us up. And we need, we need to be taken to you. And, and God, Dr. Jesus, needs to work us over and help us and heal us. Uh, <coughs> physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, and I pray you just help us to, to realize that uh, you're the one... It's got the power to do things, Lord, in this universe. And thank you that you're on our side, God. Uh, bless us now. Help us as we take a break. And uh, thank you for the services that are coming up. Help us to sing to you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.